Hello friend, glad you could make it. In this video, I will be talking about the fourth step in buying a home in Chicago, which is negotiating an offer. Guys, this is exciting, okay? It's not theoretical anymore. Now we're down to business, so much so that I had to wear a tie for this. You know, um, a lot of people, a lot of people's favorite favorite uh, part was back in step three, the, the finding the house, but this, this is my favorite. You guys like dogs? I like dogs. Got this picture of the uh, tug of war, and I have this picture of the tug of war going on between these two lovely little puppies. Because I mean, that's kind of what uh, what a negotiation a negotiation can can feel like at times. You know, there's some give, there's some take, there's some push, there's some pull. Um, and uh, yeah, ultimately, you know, ultimately the game the game is over, and um, I guess you know somebody's going home with the rope. And in this case, hopefully, you're going home with a you're going home to a new house. I mean, this is your first time uh, running into me on the interwebs. My name is Jake Lyons. I am a real estate agent here in the Chicago area with Berkshire Hathaway. This is actually the fourth, um, the fourth video of a five video series that I'm doing on how to buy a home in Chicago. If you missed the last three, there should be links to them somewhere in the vicinity of this video. Uh, the first one was arranging your financing. The second one was finding a real estate agent you can trust. And the third one was um, searching, actually searching for your home, actually fit, you know, having a online search or a, uh, MLS search and sort of what, what goes into that, what kind of, what, what certain criteria is that you should be looking at and just sort of what the uh, general concept of actually going about your home search process looks like. But, you know, yeah, like I said, it's not, this isn't theoretical anymore. Now we're at the finish line. Now it's game time. So, uh, let's get into this. Uh, the factors that go into a negotiation, at least in, in the real estate space here. There's a lot of them. Uh, there's, there's, I'm sure there's a, a ton of stuff that we won't even get to now. There's all kinds of negotiation tactics and strategies and, you know, different, different, the, you know, this is and that's and what have you's. But, you know, for the fact, for the uh, case of this video, just so the video doesn't, become two hours long. Um, we're just going to go into sort of the main, oh, the main kind of variables that are at play here when we're talking about um, what are we, you know, considering, what kind of factors are we considering when, when making an offer on a property? Okay. Is that cool with you guys? The first one I'm going to talk about is the CMA. I think this is the first time I've actually talked about a CMA. I could have easily talked about it back in step two with the real estate agent because your real estate agent should be should be very uh, adept at creating CMAs. If you don't know what a CMA is, and um, you know, honestly, why should you? A CMA is a comparative market analysis. So what that does is, as the um, you know title would suggest. It takes the comparable properties. It takes properties that are comparable to the property that you are putting an offer on, or considering buying an offer on, and uh, compares it to all of the the um, properties that are similar to that property that are available now, that are for sale now, that are maybe contingent, and especially there's a, a, a very large weight on. Um, pr similar properties that have sold, that have actually closed in, in the area. So in Chicago, you don't, um, you don't really want to go anywhere. You, when you're doing a CMA, you don't want to run comps um, any, for any longer than, or any farther than a mile radius outside of the property that you're, th that you're talking about. And you really want to get as uh, specific as possible with the types of properties that you're including in your analysis. You know, you really want to get as um, as close to the subject property as possible. You know, so if you're buying a five a five bedroom house for um, six hundred thousand dollars, and you see that there was, you know, you think that's overpriced because you saw a uh, you know a two a two bedroom house down the street close less la uh, last month for uh, 250,000. Well, you know, that's a big difference that that was bedroom, that bedroom count is a pretty big difference. Right. So, and that, that's something you have to factor in. So, you know, only compare like to like, and, and you'll get a good estimate of 
what what that property that you're that you're bidding on you know should actually be going for maybe it's maybe it's um maybe you should be offering the, uh, the offering price or maybe lower maybe higher this depends on what's going on another big factor i would argue the second most important factor is time on market a lot of uh there's a lot of psychology going on with this one you know i mean um theoretically if uh how if if a property just came on the market if it's only been on market you know a week or less um and you're looking to come in very very low on a bid the just common sense the odds of a seller responding positively to a low bid on a on a property that they just put out on the market is significantly lower than let's say if it's been on the market for a year you know there's plenty of properties that sit on the market for months years you know um these things these, these things happen and so the idea is this isn't always true it depends on the seller it depends on the psychology of the seller and other other god only knows what other factors but you know if we're talking just honing in on this time of time on market you know uh theoretically the longer it's been on the market the more leeway that you should have on how much you can you can offer okay absorption rates this is a, a fancy term that we uh that we like to throw around an absorption rate is really just a way of knowing if it's a buyer's market a seller's market or a neutral market so you hear you hear these terms i think way more often than absorption rate you know it's like what what's absorption rate so all absorption all this stuff means is it's it's basically just dividing the uh, number of houses on the market divided by the number of houses that were bought. So that that's how you determine, you know, it's sort of this a supply and demand uh, supply and demand equation of like there's this many more properties out there than there are buyers. There's this, there's this much more supply than there is demand, or this much more demand than there is supply, and and that's how you determine. So when uh, absorption rate is is put in terms of uh, months supply very often so um anything one through three months supply is considered a buyer's market i'm sorry that's that's wrong one through three months supply is considered a seller's market um four through six so i actually have this in a weird order um yeah so one through three months supply is considered a seller's market four through six is considered a neutral market so that's just kind of you know um it's a neutral it's a, uh, i don't know a better word for it it's a neutral market and then anything anything six and above is considered a buyer's market so that just means that there are a ton more houses or condos or multi you know whatever the thing is there's a lot more properties out there than there are buyers for them so that means that you, the buyers have more choices, you know, so that's, that's all that means. But it's a big deal because it, it does play into, you know, what, what you should be offering that knowing, knowing what's going on in the, in the greater kind of scheme of things in the, in, in the, in the market is, um, plays a big role in determining what kind of price that you should be offering and how, how much leverage you, you really have and what the seller thinks that you know, how much leverage the seller thinks they have. It's all about leverage. Seller's motivation. So this one can be hard to discern. Obviously, we are not in the seller's head. And if we're on the buy side, we're pretty much just limited to what the listing agent is willing to tell us about the about the seller and their motivation. And um, or, you know, I guess some, sometimes you run into a situation where maybe it's a for sale by owner or maybe the owner is the one doing the showings and you can talk to the owner themselves and just have a conversation that way. But, you know, for the vast majority of the time, you're going to be having to just get whatever you can out of the listing agent. And sometimes they're they're forthcoming. Sometimes they're not, um, you know, it just depends on kind of a luck, luck of the draw and how much information you can get on regarding the seller's motivation. But, you know, the more you can get, the better, because obviously, you know, if if the seller is kind of in a position where they're like, 
look, we don't we don't actually have to move, but if we get an offer that absolutely blows us away, then yeah, sure, whatever. I guess I'll I guess I'll move. You know, that's a that's a much tougher um, that's a much t- tougher situation to negotiate with than you know something like um, something happened. I I just I, I got a job and I need to move by next week kind of thing, you know, like that, those are very opposite ends of the spectrum where, uh, the motivation is going to be, is going to be very different. And if you can get a little glimpse into that, into that world, into the sellers, you know, into the sellers, uh, mindset there, then you, um, definitely have, have more negotiating power. You have, you know, more, more information, the more, the more information that all of this comes down to leverage and information. You know, that's what all of this is. That's, that's what the CMA is about. That's what the time on market's about. That's what the absorb. That's what all of this, you know, leverage is information. Information is leverage. It's all, it's all cyclical. It all, it all counts. And it can be difficult to find out. Thank you past me for pointing that out. And the financial strength of the buyer. So here's one that, uh, this one, you know, this one's on you. This one depends on what kind of financing you're bringing to the table, what kind of, earnest money deposits are you bringing to the table? What kind of, um, um, you know, can, can you close, can you close in two weeks or does it have to be 60 days? Do you have to sell your house first before you can buy a place? You know, all of these types of things, all of these types of things definitely factor in. I mentioned earnest money deposits. So an earnest money deposit is a certain amount of money that you deposit. Think it's almost like a down payment you can think of it that way. If, uh, if, if any of you have, you know, ever rented a place before, you can almost think of it that way. Um, it's basically just a way of showing how serious you are to the seller about the, about, about buying this place. You know, so uh, the, the theory, the idea of the earnest money deposit is that if you should pull out of the deal for no good reason at all, then you forfeit your earnest money deposit and the seller gets to keep that. So earnest money deposits are anywhere. I, you know, 1%, 1%, I would argue, is kind of the kind of the minimum you should do. 1% of whatever you're offering, of whatever the price is that you're offering. If you're offering um, $400,000 on a place, then your earnest money deposit should be certainly no less than $4,000. Um, up to 5%, up to 10%. I mean, the more, really, the more the better, um, just to show how serious you are. And the fact that the earnest money deposit, once you're under contract, is going into escrow and is going toward you know, your closing costs or your down payment or whatever, um, that needs to go to anyway, you know, it's not, it's not like an extra thing. It's not like you have this, you have the down payment, you have your closing costs, you know, your fees and your this and that, and the earnest money deposit. No, the earnest money deposit is already, is already in there. Um, and you know, if you do come across something where say there's a bad inspection or, um, or just, Uh, what am I trying to say? Um, you know, the attorney review comes up with something bad or just, if there's some legitimate reason to back out of the deal, you get your earnest money back. So it's not, it's, it's very rare that somebody can actually lose their earnest money. I mean, you really have to, you, you really kind of have to, um, you know, not just, just pull out for no good reason. Like I said, you know, pull out of the deal for no good reason to, to really lose your earnest money and for that to be a fight. And even if you do, I mean, most of the time, um, most of the time to the, to the other side, it's not even, it's not worth the fight. And it's just like, yeah, okay, whatever. Here's your, here's your deposit back, but they do have the right to keep it. If that's the case, as soon as this goes away, I'll see what that is. Okay. Terms and condition, uh, terms and contingencies, I should say. So terms, are you know just the things like um what are the terms on so are you is it, is it cash is how are you how are you buying the place how are you uh taking possession of it um those are the main those are the main those are the big ones I'm sure there's something i'm forgetting but you know those are how are you paying for it and how what's the possession uh what's the title situation like you know things like that and then contingencies so the whole my whole next slide is about contingencies so let's just go over to that so a common contingency. Well, first off, what even is a contingency? So all a contingency means is that if these certain terms are not met, then we have no deal. That's, you know, 
That's the definition of what a contingency is. It's, like it's something that a term that has to be met or else there is no deal. The most common contingencies are the attorney review. It's very important that you have that you have a real estate attorney. Um, the, it, it's just it's just a good idea. There's a lot that goes into this stuff, and it's just good to have somebody um, in, on your side who who knows how to navigate all the all the different um, paperwork and all the um, all the disclosures and all the you know files from the say it's like from the HOA from the city from this and, that, and kind of coordinating with the lender, making sure all that stuff is in place. So. You know, your agent's going to do like, some of that stuff, but the attorney is is, um, is is doing things that the agent isn't doing, that the agent legally can't do because the agent probably doesn't have, you know, probably uh, can't legally practice law. Probably, I would assume. Uh, I'm sure there's maybe a couple lawyer agents out there, but anyway. Uh, mortgage contingency. So this one is, is basically, yeah, if you apply for the mortgage and then you get declined for the mortgage, then that's it. No deal. You know? Um, so that's kind of a little bit of a risk that the, that the seller is taking on you. That's why, that's why the type of financing that you're getting and uh, back to the point of the um, buyer's financial strength is a big deal. So, you know, if you're, if you're coming in with a, say, um, I mean, cash will, of course, be the top. It will be the, the most attractive to a seller. But, you know, outside of that, let's just say you're coming in with a, um, a conventional loan and you're putting 30% down and you're coming in with 10% earnest money, you know, those types of things. Um, that's going to look that's just going to look better than somebody coming in with, say, an FHA loan, putting three and a half percent down and one percent earnest money. So. You know, and a, a multiple bid situation, especially those are the type of things you should you should be considering. Anyway, so with a yeah, with a mortgage contingency, that's that's pretty much all that means um, is that if you don't get the mortgage, then that's then you can then you'll ha you have to back out of the deal. There's not a whole lot more that anyone can do. <clears throat> Excuse me. Inspection contingency. This one is. This one's a big deal too. So some people, you know, and you can, this is also, uh, some people can waive, you can wait, you have the right to waive any of these contingencies and um, make the, make your offer stand out that way. So a, a lot of deals do fall apart because of a bad inspection. So, you know, if you want to really reassure the, the, the seller even more, you can uh, waive your right to an inspection and, any, you know, anything that you find um, that's wrong with the place uh, <clears throat> isn't is that, you, you know, you, it's not it's not the responsibility of the seller. You you waived your right to an inspection and that's what you did. Uh, it's obviously very risky. I wouldn't advise you would do that um, unless it's absolutely necessary. And that's, you know, what you feel like that's just your best piece of leverage to say maybe you are coming in with a. Um, uh, maybe your your financial strength is not so great, or you don't have the quite you know a, a very attractive earnest money deposit, or you're coming in with you know a, a lesser, a perceived lesser type of loan, or whatever the case may be, and there's a multiple bid situation, and you know you, you don't really have a whole lot to stand out in the field of these bids. Well, you know you can maybe if you really if you really uh, have a good feeling about the place and maybe, you, you know, you've been around the block a few times with these kinds of things, you can waive your inspection. You can waive whatever you want, really. You can you can waive your attorney review if you really wanted to, although I definitely wouldn't recommend that either. So the inspection is a big deal. Uh, you definitely really want to know what's going on in the house or the property before before you get in there. Um, and you want to make it you want to have a good inspector. And there's a lot of good inspectors, man, but. Inspectors can be kind of an odd bunch of people if you, uh, no, no offense to any inspectors out there, but there's a lot of times, you know, they like to get in there and maybe kind of try to try to prove their value just a little bit, a little bit, just a tad bit too much. And they end up kind of fear mongering a little bit and they try, they, they, you know, um, let's just say there's like a, a couple, a couple wires mixed up in behind a, uh, an outlet or something. And, you know, it's just, it, it's one sentence worth to say there's a couple wires mixed up to just open it up, do this thing, you know, go to, go to home Depot, buy a couple things. It's 10 bucks in 10 minutes of your time. But, you know, I've seen, you know, 
people will try to just blow this up, blow this whole thing up and go into all kinds of things that just don't really need to. And then, you know, how you, then you as the buyer, now your head is spinning about all this, like, you know, not knowing any better, just thinking like, oh no, is there <laughs> like, what's going on? Is, is the house going to burn down because the uh, wires are crossed behind the outlet? No, you know, so there's, there's this, you know, um, interview some inspectors and to see, see uh, who you like or go with your real estate agent's recommendation. It would be my, would be my guess, my recommendation for that. Insurance, you gotta get, gotta be able to get insurance. You have to be able, you have to have, be, be insurable and be able to prove that you can obtain insurance for a property that you are getting. Sale of real estate. This one would come into play if you have a property that you must sell before you have the ability to purchase a new property. Um, this one can be tough, you know, it's cause for a, for the seller to take, to take the chance on that. I mean, the, <laughs> the seller is really, uh, putting a lot of, a lot of faith in you being able to sell that, to sell that house, you know? So, it, um, the sellers, you know, in my experience, probably not really going to accept that unless, unless they have no other offers, you know, if there's anything else, then, um, they're probably going to do that, but it happens. It happens all the time. It happens every day. Um, these types of transactions definitely do happen. So don't let me, you know, steer you, steer you away from it. If it's, if it's what you got to do is what you got to do. And, um, yeah, so that's, that's how that works. That's a contingency. You know, and then if you can't, if uh, it's usually it's on a time frame, so it's like you know, I I we agree to the terms of this deal so long as the house that I have under property sells within say sixty days, um, and it's, and then a certain amount of time after that is when is when the closing would be set up. So if after that certain amount of time passes and the house still hasn't sold, then the deal falls down. You get your earnest money back, and the seller has to put their put their house back on the market and try over again with somebody else. What else we got? We have as is. As is isn't really a, a contingency. It's more of just a, um, a condition, I guess. Um, but I, I wanted to talk about it a little bit anyway. So what as is means, all as is means is that the seller is not willing to repair anything. Uh, it doesn't necessarily, you know, it, it, a lot of people think it, it means that you can't, you can't have an inspection. Uh, this definitely is not what it means. You can, you can have an inspection, although there are properties that do specifically say that you can't have an inspection, which is always a, 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 that's a major red flag if you see that. Um, but you know, um, yeah, so it just means, you know, maybe you, if, if, if something crazy comes up in the inspection, maybe you can, uh, negotiate on, you know, bring, bring the price down a little bit or, or, or have ask, um, request a credit for whatever the repairs are that will need to be done. But it just, it basically just means that, um, the seller is going to be hands off on that and will not be making any repairs themselves before closing. Cool. And then anything that is lawfully agreed upon, I mean, there's really no limits to this stuff. You can agree on anything you want. Um, I'll just let your own your own imagination run wild with that. You know, you can you can write it right up in the contract that uh, you know it, it, people must show up at the at, at closing with a red tie, or else this uh, this this deal is going to fall apart. And if people don't show up, somebody shows up with you know if I if if I don't get that memo and I show up wearing this tie, eh, the deal's off. You know, that's a silly a silly example, but it's just. Uh, yeah, you can whatever you want to do. If it's agreed upon by both parties, as long as it's not illegal, then that's a good, that becomes a, a term, a contingency. So I'm going to go over just a little bit of the pro, uh, the procedure of submitting an offer. Okay. So you're going to write and sign the official offer using a standardized real estate contract. Um, yeah, just a, just a piece of paper that says, you know, I agree to buy your house for this amount with this. I mean, it, I guess it would work in a court of law maybe, but it's, um, it's definitely better 
to to use the uh, the standard contracts that we have that you know the that our local real estate boards write write for us and have every have everybody's best interests in mind. They are really honestly very well written. I mean they they cover pretty much any any if and or but that you can think of, and I mean it was, it's almost it's almost a bit like almost seems like a bit too much sometimes, but. You know, as you're going through and signing a hundred things and going through all these different pages, just realize that it really is in your best in your best interest to to use that kind of that kind of contract that's provided for us. Anyway, so you'll write and yeah, you'll write and sign uh, that official offer. You'll send it off to the to the uh, to the seller, probably via via your agent. And uh, most of the time nowadays, this will be done electronically, so we can. Uh, that's um, it's legal, legally binding, legally, you know, acceptable to have um, e-signatures count as at least in, at, at this step of the uh, at the way. So, at, you know, when we get to the closing table, sometimes a lot of those things will require you to actually physically sign a wet signature. But, you know, in these in these um, in these steps, e-signatures are fine. You'll submit it to the seller or most likely the seller's agent, and then they will talk amongst themselves. If it is accepted, then uh, congratulations. You just, you just, you know, are one huge step closer to purchasing a house. You can proceed to step five, which is getting to the closing table. And um, you'll see you should be, the link to that should be around here somewhere. If not, then you're going to engage in as many rounds of negotiation as it takes until you meet a deal, until you uh, come to a deal, until you make a deal, or until you don't. Remember that picture back in the beginning with the dogs? This is when this is where that comes into play. So you know it, it could be the rounds of negotiation can be centered around any number of things. It's usually price, but it can be um, different you know repairs that need to be made. It can be around maybe certain appliances that you want them to keep or that you want to stay or that you don't want to stay or whatever, whatever the case may be. No limit of things that, you know, that we, we can be talking about here, but yeah, so that's in a nutshell. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. And then, yeah. And then if, if the agreement is not possible, then we'll go back to step three, which is searching for a house. So you know, there's a lot, there's a lot writing on step four. There's a lot writing on this, on, on the, on the offer. Um, a lot of people don't like it. A lot of people, you know, maybe a little, a little conflict averse, things like that. And, you know, I get it. It's stressful, but got to do it. So that's all I have for this video. If you liked it, please let me know by giving me a thumbs up or a like, or, you know, whatever is appropriate for whatever platform you're watching this on. Subscribe. Um, you know, leave me a comment, reach out. I've got my contact info on pretty much all these slides, I'm pretty sure. So, um, yeah, I've got links to other socials and chicagohomesource.com if you want to take a look at what's on the market right now. And yeah, just go ahead and follow the trail to the next video where our, um, assuming that we did reach a deal in this video, I will, or in this, on this step, I will be talking about what to do to get to the closing table. See you there.